Hey guys, I'm sorry, I had some sort of crazy technical issue. I had to restart. Unfortunately, I had to delete my previous stream and start again, but I believe I am now live. So yeah, I do apologize for that. Um, yeah, I've also just received the news, as we all have, that Hatun Tash was stabbed at Speaker's Corner. Um, this is horrific. Um, yeah, we obviously wish her well. Hey, Dragon, thank you for being here. Um, yeah, we, we hope that she is not badly injured, that she recovers soon, that this man who did this to her is caught. And uh, this is this is horrific news. Um, and yeah, unfortunately, if you've studied the fiqh, if you've watched some of my previous shows, I did discuss this. Why? in Islam, violence must escalate. It's because of the doctrine of commanding the right and forbidding the wrong. This doctrine must escalate. It has to go from words to physical violence. Eventually, it'll escalate to gang violence. So moving from that slap that she had to use of weapons to a gang, this is the standard progression. This is how it must be. So yeah, so while I'm here, uh, let me just jump into this. And uh, yeah, I managed to fix my technical issue. So let me actually just put myself on the top left for the moment. Um, this, so yeah, if anybody wants to chat with me specifically to send me a text, just at my name, right? And I'll try and respond to you. Have a look at this line here. This thing very clearly says, whoever annoys Allah is a disbeliever whose blood it is permissible to spill. Okay, so if you annoy Allah, you're a disbeliever. Now, she was wearing that Muhammad cartoon t-shirt. Okay, so this is one of the reasons that she had to be killed. I'm, I'm going to go to the top. This book is called The Summary of the Unsheathed Sword Against the One Who Insults the Messenger. It's by the very first Sheikh al-Islam in Islam. So this is Ibn Taymiyyah, right? And let's go and see what it says to us. So, yes, Lexa, welcome to London Stan. Okay, this book is the definitive document, Islamic laws and rulings, the Ijma rulings, on what happens when someone insults Muhammad. Whoever insults the Prophet is to be killed, whether they are Muslim or a disbeliever. Now, David Wood was talking recently on YouTube about what he thinks the Quran says and what he thinks the Hadith says. David Wood needs to stop looking at the Quran. He needs to stop looking at the Hadith. He needs to read the Fiqh. Someone please tell him this. He does not have to do exegesis of these books that were done 800 to 1,000 years ago and completed 800 to 1,000 years ago. He can simply go to the Fiqh and get the standard, the, the orthodox interpretation from the top scholars of Islam right now easily. You can just read it in black and white, and that one verse or those two verses and that one hadith will be explained in 50 or 60 pages of absolutely disgusting detail. He does not have to do exegesis or guess or imply or infer. Just go to the fiqh and read it. David Wood, unfortunately, has no idea what the sharia is. He uses that word. He has no idea what the sharia is. And unfortunately, this is the case for 99% for of people who talk about the fiqh, especially within Christian apologetics and polemics. Um, yes, the fiqh is the completed version of Islam. Yeshua is Yahweh. That is correct. Don't forget, Quran is abrogated. Hadith are abrogated. So what is left, what remains, is the fiqh. This is what is final, the final interpretation. Killing is prescribed on him, the one who insults the prophet, and it is not permissible to imprison or show favor to him or ransom him. Now, someone showed him the Ashifa by Qadi Iyad. This is not a fiqh manual, okay? This is a sirah. It's basically a biography. And it talks about the fine virtues of Muhammad, right? So it's not, shall we say, finally authoritative, whereas this is, okay? So... Any Muslim or non-Muslim who insults the Prophet is killed and repentance is not sought. So understand, this is the final ruling. Now, let's have a look here. Whoever insults the Prophet is to be killed. This is the general view of the scholars. 
The scholars have consensus that whoever insults Muhammad is to be killed. He mentions here all the founders of the schools of fiqh. The Muslims have unanimous agreement upon killing whoever insults the Prophet. It is the ruling that whoever insults other than him is to be lashed. Now, I know David Wood has been mentioning this uh, Muslim from France. That guy is talking out of his butt. Excuse my French. Okay? He has no idea what he's talking about. He's possibly being truthful, but he's not knowledgeable enough to give a proper answer. Two, he's giving just enough truth to be helpful, but he's going to start lying shortly afterwards once you start believing him. So the consensus is taken to be the consensus from the Tabi'in and the companions. So this goes to all of Muhammad's major supporters. So understand, the scholars have consensus that whoever insults the messenger, someone who attributes a defect to him, such a person is a disbeliever. And we've already clarified, disbelievers are killed, whether you are Muslim, or non-Muslim. I do not know anyone who differed concerning the obligation to kill such a person. Understand, this is very, very clear. Hatun has, as far as they're concerned, crossed the line, she must be killed. This is very unfortunate. This falls under the doctrine. So you've seen the doctrine of Sabah Rasul insulting Muhammad. Now, commanding the right and forbidding the wrong. Someone, please, David Wood needs to learn this. I am, David Wood, I love his work, okay? He's he's really, he's out there, he's doing what he needs to do. But he's working at the most basic ABC level of Islam, the, the most basic, basic level of knowledge. He needs to step up. I haven't seen him do anything new for nearly five years. And he needs to understand what the fiqh is, okay? What the law is. He needs to stop making guesses about what. He needs to jump, because this is in black and white. Understand, before I move to my talk, I want to finish this. There's an obligation to command the right, okay? And there are levels of censure. So there are degrees of severity, okay? So you need to explain to Hartun that she's doing something wrong. Then you have to forbid the act verbally. So in the first level, you've got to now be polite. The second level, you have to be commanding. The third level, you have to be vile, abusive. The, the fiqh, the sharia, whatever you want to call it right? The Islamic law requires abusive behavior. Then if you cannot fix it, you then move to writing the wrong by hand. That Muslim man who slapped her in the park, he was writing the wrong by hand. Notice they've been following these steps. Now, the fact that they're written in this order doesn't mean they need to be followed. The standard Islamic narrative is a bunch of bollocks, villainous, and you and I know this. Everyone knows this. Okay, it's a lie told to idiots. Okay, and people are happy to believe it because it, they can they can stop thinking at that point. Why would you listen to people who continuously, habitually lie to you? It's, it's silly. I'm sorry, but but so anyway. So he hit her right. He righted the wrong by hand. Then comes intimidation, assault, and force of arms. Understand, notice that writing the wrong by hand comes before intimidation. They don't consider that to be severe. Punching her in the face is not considered severe. A bunch of bollocks, okay? Look, I'm from the third world. I am not as PC as certain people who grew up in the West and were emasculated at school. I am not that guy. Understand? I am not that guy. So, force of arms is next. Now, the fact that they're written in this order does not by any means mean that they have to follow it in this order. There is no order. They can start here by literally killing you as the first step. I understand. Okay, so I wanted to get that out the way, but please be clear on that. So are there any questions or anyone? Okay, understand Muslims are required. It is obligatory. It is mandatory. It is not an option. It is not optional. They must, they have to, they are required to lie to you. This is not an option. Okay, whether a Muslim does so or not today, maybe tomorrow he will. Okay, his behavior does not tell you what the Islamic doctrine necessarily says. Okay, they are required to lie to you, to defeat you. Understand, and if that doesn't work, they have to ultimately assault you. Understand, this is the religion of assault, the religion of force of arms. Okay, so anyway, just thank you, XYZ. So, yeah.
Tars and jungle, exactly. So I think Westerners have forgotten just how nasty it gets out there. They have forgotten how deceptive, deceitful, and dishonest people can be. Okay, this is a different morality. She has a shorter escalation sequence, says Erkin. Polite words, force of hand, force of arms. Yes. Um, yeah, otherwise they're very similar. But understand, they don't have to. Even the Sunnis don't have to go through these steps. Okay. So, remember, there are 14. There's at least 14 kinds of jihad. Okay? 14 kinds. And lying to you is one of them. So, okay, that out the way. I'll stop here. If anyone has any questions, please ask me. I'll be happy to, to provide input. Okay? If there's any requirement, please let me know. So, yeah, this is horrific. And again, our thoughts, prayers go out to Hatun. She is... She is a very brave woman, but they are going to try to kill her. I had told Thaddeus from Reason Dances Apologetics, the next step is they will try to kill her. I told him that. And uh, if you've listened to me speak, you know, some of you may, I may have told this to some of you, but this is unfortunately how it happens. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. So guys, I'm here to talk about the Apostle Paul. I, sorry about the technical issue earlier, the delay. That was problematic um but i fixed that so guys any questions before we go on just at my name right and i'll answer you so any questions from you guys okay so guys i'm just going to jump into this then let's start talking about what i call polemics okay which is obviously a play on the word polemics which is about the okay yeah, Thaddeus has been silent for a long time. He hasn't responded to me. I believe he's had some sort of family issue. Um, so if anyone does hear from him, please, um, you know, just let him know we're all thinking of him. We all miss him. And um, we'd love to hear from him again. She is very brave. Yes. So, guys, so I have, these are just three of the manuals that I've made. I've read about 200 pages, okay? A couple of hundred pages on the subject, and I've been distilling it and summarizing it into this presentation. Okay, so this is one of the books. Now, um, in the previous show, I had linked every single source. Unfortunately, I deleted that video, so I also I did not save the um, the description box. What I will do is after this video, I will have to redo everything in the description box and provide you every single reference that I'm going to use here today. Okay, because I provided the name and the download link for every single reference that I'm using today. So, Arab Christians and the Quran from the Origins of Islam to the Medieval Period. This is one of the books by Mark Beaumont available online. Everything's available online for you to download. This one's the Bible through a Quranic filter, scripture falsification, tahrif in the 8th and 9th century. However, I've worked from the 8th to the 14th century. And of course, this one is a gem. Good grief. This guy was having fun writing this one. The Islamic image of Paul and the origin of the gospel of Barnabas. This thing is like reading a murder mystery. It is incredibly good. This scholar nailed it. So... Yes, Villainous, uh, so his wife is ill. Okay, yes, I, he did tell me that the last we spoke. So, yeah, let's, let's hope that, that things improve there. Um, yeah, so yeah, all the best to him. Okay, so guys, the Islamic image of Paul and the origins of the Gospel of Barnabas. This one is very well worth reading. Okay, this book is 15 pages. It is excellent work. So let me jump into the presentation. I'll just start. And we shall be off to the races. So, polemics. Islam versus St. Paul. Obviously a play on the word polemics. So, as you will know, St. Paul has been under attack from Islamic scholars. I hesitate to call them scholars. They are scholars and they're historians. Quote, unquote, supposed historians. But they're really just liars. And... I'm going to be referencing heavyweights, okay, from each century. These are major scholars in Islam. These are highly trained Islamic scholars. These are not nobodies. And you'll find that these guys are the most clueless bunch of liars you've ever come across, okay? So these are some of my major sources on the Quranic accusation of scriptural falsification, okay, from Gabriel Said Reynolds. That's the link there. You can download that. Then, of course, the Islamic image of Paul, okay, you've seen that. And then, of course, this book here, Excerpts from a New Gospel from Ernst Bammel, again, also available online, Early Islamic Perspectives, and others. And those will be referenced as we come up. Okay, yes, Skolai is Yeshua. Okay, historians versus high historians. Yeah, these guys are high on something. It's something from camels, I'm telling you. Okay, so, guys, 
Part one, Islam is the religion of deceit. So this presentation has a part two, polemics part two, which leads up to the gospel of Barnabas. And then part three will present the neutral to positive evidence that the Muslim scholars wrote in the previous centuries regarding St. Paul. So there was a time when they were positive about St. Paul, neutral to positive. And of course, this changed significantly, but it even started as early as the 8th century where they were highly negative towards Paul. And I always forget to do this. Erkan is someone who always is very kind to me to uh, remind people. Please, guys, like, share, subscribe. Okay, all the reference works are in the description box for download. Unfortunately, I deleted the last stream. I'll have to recreate this, the, the description box. So please wait for that after the show. Okay, and guys, also, uh, it's a great deal of work, time and effort. Um, but so please do donate if you appreciate the information and you want to support me. So let's begin. So overview, Muslim historians versus Paul. So in today's exciting episode, we are going to learn how Muslim historians and scholars claim that one, Paul was the king of the Jews. Did you know that St. Paul was the king of the Jews? I didn't know that, you didn't know that, but they knew that. Christians followed Islam for 81 years after Jesus died. Did you know that? I wasn't aware of that. Guys, with, with fantastic information like this, you know that you need to start saying Shahada right now. So, Marek, hello, welcome. Uh, thank you for being here. So, yeah, Christians followed Islam for 81 years after Jesus died. Okay. Yeshua, you did, yeah, well, now you're going to learn because the hikama is about to flow. <laughs> the bright, warm, yellow hikama. No, no arrests have been made to Twinen. So, unfortunately, not yet. Okay. Also, the word hikama actually comes from a Jewish word, mahokma. Okay. So, hikama is also stolen from, from, from Jewish, right? From, from, from Jewish, um, from, well, from Hebrew. Okay, from the Jews. So, Hikama comes from Hakma. Okay. So, we also have to learn that Paul, who was a wicked Jew, committed suicide to destroy Christianity. He committed suicide as a sacrifice to Jesus to destroy Christianity. We're going to learn that today. Okay. So, next, we'll also learn that Paul was a good Christian. And he influenced the Romans to get them to destroy the Jews. So Paul was a wicked Jew that committed suicide to destroy Christianity, but Paul was a very good Christian who tried to get the Romans to kill the Jews. No contradiction there at all. So <laughs> Christians had never thought Jesus was divine. Paul was the one who invented this idea. Paul introduced this. So Paul invented the concept and the doctrine of the Trinity. Okay. And Paul is responsible for the Crusades. I bet you didn't know that. We need to start rewriting the history books. So, no, sorry, we don't have to. These guys have already done it for us. And the reason the Crusades were started was because, you see, they needed to defend Paul's lies because all the kings of Europe knew that Paul had lied and that Christianity was false. And the Muslims were going to reveal this in Europe. You see, they were going to... And, and so they had to attack the Middle East to prevent the Muslims from spreading this truth about, you know. So guys, get ready. And of course, Muslims saved Christ's true teachings. Aren't we so lucky? We're so lucky. Okay, so now Paul is set apart as a defender of Christianity. Yes, incredible nonsense, and we're going to go through that. Read these documents for yourself. Seriously, it's, it's ridiculous. So, Galatians 1, Paul is an apostle, not from human beings, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead. There are some, and he says, there are some who wish to pervert the gospel of Christ. So, Paul stands apart from the other apostles. He was not named by men. He was named by Jesus himself, by God, right, as an apostle. So, therefore, he holds a status different to the others. Right now, in 1 Timothy 4, we see now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Understand also within Paul's gospel, right within the books he wrote, Paul goes on the attack. Paul's a polemicist, he goes straight for the juggler. Now, how do you kill a circus? You go for the juggler, okay? So, so anyway, so that's what Paul did. 
Small joke there. Okay, so Paul was a polemicist. He named and shamed people. He went straight at them. So I think, now look, I haven't yet found a definitive reason as to why Muslims specifically attack Paul. I'm hoping to find a, a clear, clear indication why. But these are, these are some good reasons why for now. Okay? Now, Paul is also very clear. Works will not justify you. Only faith in Christ will. Now, of course, Islam is a religion of works. And all these Gnostic sects are a religion of works. They are not here to bring you salvation. They are to bring you salvation from ignorance. Better knowledge. They're smarter than you. Okay? And Nathaniel says, fun fact, in Dutch we actually say guchem, meaning smart, from the Hebrew Arabic hikmah. Well, I just mentioned, I wonder if Afrikaans also... No, it doesn't sound familiar. Near chalatni, Nathaniel. This uh, near... Slim, an Afrikaans called it slimvious, okay? um, but I'll think about it. Might be something there. Okay, now Islam uses reframing. They use word games. It's all just semantics. So now Muslims claim that Moses, Jesus, and all the biblical prophets were Muslims, and they all practiced Islam. Now this last bit in blue says the holiness was Muhammad's light. Don't forget, Muhammad was made out of Allah. Muhammad is of the same essence as Allah. Okay, so Muhammad has two natures, divine and human, right? And of course, a piece of Muhammad was then taken and placed into the, into the prophets, right? So that their holiness is actually a reflection of Muhammad's light. That's why they're all Muslims, right? And that's why you were born a Muslim. But understand, when they say Muslims, according to the scholarly works that I've been reading, when they say Muslims, they mean monotheists. Because Islam technically was not invented until Muhammad came. In fact, Islam was only basically perfected, what, 23 years after the Quran first came down to Muhammad, right? So Muslims, they mean monotheists. And by translation of the word Islam, what we find out that they mean monotheism predating Christianity. A monotheism, they don't necessarily mean Judaism, they mean monotheism. Because Jesus brought a partial revelation and Muhammad completed that revelation. So Mo was 360,000 years old, okay? So understand there were veils that were created, right? So there were these veils. So Mo was 13,000 years old. Mo is also 170,000 years old. Mo is 360,000 years old. No confusion there. But understand there are these there are these veils, right? There's the veil of might, the veil of beauty, the veil of transcendence, the veil of holiness, the veil of blah, blah, blah. And Mo spends 11,000 years in the veil of might. Then he spends 8,000 years in the veil of knowledge. Then he spends 9,000 years in the veil of holiness. And so on and so on and so on. And you get to a different age. Now, this is a belief that is common to both Shia and Sunni Islam. It's, they're the same. So, Moses received an Islamic scripture. He was given a book by Allah, the Torah. Jesus also got a book. God said, here you go. Here's your book, Jesus. It's called the Gospel, the Injil. Okay? And now... What they claim is the religious communities suppressed the religion of Jesus and they altered the text. But certain believers, right, stayed true. Yes, Emil, Muhammad is the prehistoric entity. Now, there's a scholar called Yakut al-Hamawi, okay, lived from 1179 to 1229, who claimed to know of a Jewish convert with an original, uncorrupted Torah. So a lot of this stuff goes back quite early, okay. This is now the 12th, 13th century. So, of course, Muslims cannot show you an original, uncorrupted Torah, supposedly. Right? So, yes, from Muhammad's new earth, mankind is made. Yes, this is crazy stuff. Now, this is another reference. You can find this easily on the internet in archive.org. So, William Muir, he is a 19th century scholar of Islam. He wrote these words in 1878. What a mighty difference between the prophet of Islam and his followers of the present time. He professed to make the sacred scriptures of the Old and New Testament the foundation of his claims and his pillar of support when attacked. Yet his current followers spend their days in the impious attempt to subvert the authority of those very scriptures. And this is a very valid point. I will tell you that 19th century scholars from the 1800s had done far better polemics, far better apologetic, apologetics and far better research than many modern scholars today. Because think about it, modern scholars today are poop scared to speak up in case they get killed, in case their careers get destroyed because of... PC, because we have nothing to fear from the religion of peace, right? Last cartoon, she knows, right? Whereas back then, Islam was not the force it is today, right? And PC was an issue back then. So Muhammad, right? Islam is nuts. <clears throat> so Muhammad used the Bible. Notice how often the Quran references the Bible and how often Muhammad references the Bible and how often Muslims come to you and say, hey, but you know, Muhammad's in the Bible. 
How often do do Christians go to Muslims and say, show us um, Jesus in the Quran? We don't care. We don't give us stuff. Think about it. We don't care. We never ask them. We, we don't care what's in the Quran, right? Because they've now been force feeding it to us, because they've been pushing it in our faces, of course, now we've now started to pay attention. But otherwise, they care about the Bible. We don't care about the Quran. So, yeah. So, let's move on. Now, Muslim scholars and the Bible. So Muslims filter the Bible through the Quran, but the problem is that the Quran is filtered through the scholars. Okay, so what this means is that it's not what the Quran says, it's what the scholars say the Quran says. Right, so now we're going to be examining Muslim claims of Christian New Testament and Old Testament biblical scripture falsification, what they call tahrif, okay, from the 8th to the 14th century in their disputational and other scholarly historical works in relation to St. Paul. Small typo there, I'll have to fix that. Ibn Hazm is, okay, Emil, Ibn Hazm, he's, um, he's what, 11th century? He's famous because he was the guy that basically crystallized. He took all the previous research, put it into a cohesive, coherent structure, and then he disseminated and distributed this. He's not the first. He's predated by at least 300 years. Okay, so now this is another book you need to become familiar with. This is called The Original Sources of the Quran by Reverend W. St. Clair Tisdall. Brilliant work. This guy did fantastic work. Okay, so we must not therefore forget that Muhammad was never brought into contact with pure gospel Christianity. Right? So because there is no evidence now i'll skip the rest you can always look at that in yourself but there is no satisfactory proof that an arabic version of the new testament existed in muhammad's time but we do know that muhammad was introduced to multiple different gnostic sects heretical sects okay heretics and because a lot of heretical works a lot of apocryphal works a lot of jewish folk tales a lot of heretical myths made their way into the quran so he never knew what New Testament Christianity was. He knew the Torah from the Jews. But until the Muslims got to Spain, they didn't have a clue what the New Testament really said. Okay? So exactly, that's why. Because until they got to Spain, until they invaded Spain and conquered Spain, they didn't have a clue. And when they opened the Bible and read it, they were like, oopsie, oopsie. Right. So the, and the one problem is that the Orthodox Church, the gospel was neglected in, often in favor of legends of saints, which appealed to the popular taste of the marvelous. Okay, this was a failing within the church. Now, Arabia was a refuge for heretics of different sects who were expelled from the Roman Empire. Right? So many of them ended up, these dregs ended up in Arabia. However, it is clear from the Quran that many of the mythical stories in the apocryphal gospels and heretical Gnostic works must have reached Muhammad and have been accepted by him as true. So, there's evidence within the Quran for this as well. Quran 25.4, but the misbelievers say, Naught is this, but a lie which Muhammad has forged and others have helped him. And yes, that is true. 25.5, and they say, Tales of the ancients which he has caused to be written, and they are dictated before him morning and evening. Allah knows best. Trust Allah on this one. And of course, in Quran 37.36, it says, Shall we forsake our gods for a mad poet? Well, you did. Sadly, you did. Moving on. Let's look at a book called, you may have heard of this before, it's called Daif Bukhari. Okay, I'm reliably told the proper name for this text is Daif Bukhari. Volume 3, book 48, hadith number 850. Ibn Abbas said, O Muslims, how do you ask the people of the scriptures through your book, i.e. the Quran? Though your book, the Quran, which was revealed to his prophet is the most, as the most recent information from Allah, and you recite it, the book that has not been distorted. So why do you ask the people of the scriptures? Why do you go to the Muslims and ask them about their book when your book is perfect? Allah has revealed to you that the people of the scriptures have changed with their own hands what was revealed to them. And they have said as regards to the changed scriptures, this is from Allah in order to get some worldly benefit thereby. And I just need to check your message. It's Khurafat Bukhari. I have no idea what Khurafat Bukhari is. You're going to have to explain that to me. So, yeah. So now, so we've apparently now corrupted our scriptures early in history to get some benefit. Now, interestingly, this hadith goes on. And it tells us that Ibn Abbas added, Isn't the knowledge revealed to you sufficient to prevent you from asking them? By Allah, I have never seen any one of them asking Muslims about what has been revealed to you. Because we don't care. Because the Quran is obviously trash. Right? Fairy tales. Didn't know. Okay. So, yeah. So, fairy tale Bukhari. Right. Moving on. So, Bukhari... 
Okay. Commented also mentioning the charge of tahrif, the corruption of the Bible. The word tahrif signifies to change a thing from its original nature, and that there is no man who'd corrupt a single word of what proceeded from Allah. So the Jews and the Christians could corrupt by misrepresenting the meaning of the words. So the Quran is clear. It's not possible to corrupt the words of Allah. So therefore, the claim was originally that we misrepresented the meaning. Okay? But now, let's look at the Spanish genius. Okay? Ibn Hazm. So let's start with this guy. I'm mentioning him first because he's the most famous, but he's not the first. In the 11th century, Ibn Hazm, or Ibn Hazm, brought the accusation of textual corruption, tahrif, of the Bible. Referring to Ibn Hazm, Gerard Niels wrote the article, Why do Muslims believe the text of the Bible has been corrupted? Right? And the article states, it tells us, in 1064, the 11th century, Ibn Hazm, from the ruling hierarchy of the Umayyad government in Cordoba, Spain, charged that the Bible had been corrupted and the Bible falsified. This charge was to defend Islam against Christianity because Ibn Hazm came upon differences and contradiction between the Bible and the Quran. Believing by faith that the Quran was true, the Bible must then be false. So he said, since the Quran must be true, it must be the conflicting gospel texts that are false. But the present text must have been falsified by Christians after the time of Muhammad. So this is the claim from this Spanish genius, this amazing scholar from 11th century Spain. Now, you can read this in Niels in 1992 in Perceptions of Christianity Among South Asian Muslims in America by Paul S. Biswas. So that's where you can find this document or you can look up Niels' original document. Right? Okay, now, <clears throat> so interesting that they make the claim that it must have been falsified after the time of Muhammad because we can confirm that the Bible today is the Bible in the 1st and 2nd century. Right? So this one's very easy to refute. Now, there are two kinds of tahrif, corruption. So recent scholars generally claim that early Islamic scholars argued that the Christians had misinterpreted their scriptures. So this is described as tahrif al-mana, a corruption of their meaning. This is different from changing the words of the Bible, tahrif al-lafs or tahrif al-nas, which is textual corruption characterized as the later view. Later view. However, we'll find that this view actually goes to the 8th century, so it's not really later. So Muhammad was very confident that the Quran was the same revelation given by Allah in the Arabic tongue, which had been given earlier to others in their language, until the scholars of Islam realized that this was entirely wrong. And suddenly the polemics had to change. Okay, suddenly the sh thing shifted. So the Quran, as we know, has a very high view of the scriptures. They call the Taurat, the Zabur, and the Injil, the Evangel, you'll sometimes see it called, which we know as the Torah, the Psalms, and the Gospel. We believe in Allah and that which is revealed unto us, and that which was revealed unto Abraham and Ishmael and Isaac and Jacob and the tribes, and that which Moses and Jesus received, and from that which the prophets received from their Lord. We make no distinction between any of them, and that's in Quran 2, 136. So it is very surprising that Muslims of subsequent generations accuse Christians and Jews of tahrif and heavily blame the Apostle Paul. So let's look at the real replacement theology, which is Islam. Islam replaces everything. So the main villain in Muslim allegations of tahrif of the original texts of Allah is Paul the Apostle. So in short, Muslims will deceitfully claim to defend true Christianity as they undermine the Christian faith to replace it with Islam. So we're going to learn about the bad rabbis and how Paul took a bribe. Paul was bribed by the rabbis. Bad rabbis, bad Paul. Ibn Hazm writes in 1064, <clears throat> who died in 1064, wrote, their rabbis on whose authority Christians have adopted their religion, the Torah, as well as the books of the prophets, peace be upon them, agreed to bribe Paul the Benjamite, the Benjaminite, may Allah curse him, they ordered Paul to profess outwardly the religion of Jesus and to deceive his followers, to deceive his Christian followers, and to induce them to follow the doctrine of Jesus' divinity, the false doctrine, of course. And they told Paul, we shall take upon ourselves your sin. And he was extremely successful, as is generally known. This is the Spanish genius Ibn Hazm writing. So there are three main accusations against Paul. One, so basically Paul is a villain in the Muslim allegations of altering the original gospel brought by Jews, Jesus, right? Making Christians heirs to an inferior view of Allah and Christian scriptures untrustworthy. Now, there are three accusations against Paul that crystallized in the 11th century with Ibn Hazm and a man called Abd al-Jabbar or Ibn al-Jabbar. 
right, who died in 1025. So these claims are integral to the Muslim doctrine of takhrif, they're poisoning the well, that is correct. So, one, Paul corrupted the laws or the practices of the true religion, abrogating circumcision, unclean foods, Roman custom, adding Roman customs, etc. Okay, Allah copies Paul's word and he's mentioned as Prophet Third. Yes, uh, we'll get into that in another show, right? Now, two, they claim that Paul corrupted the doctrine of the Tawhid by fabricating both the doctrines of the Trinity and the divinity of Christ. And three, Paul corrupted the text of the Bible. So these are the claims that Muslim scholars make. So now let's look at Qadi ibn al-Jabbar and his questionable polemics. So he writes about, quote unquote, what the Jews and the Christians believe in his books, right? So he writes that, for instance, the day before Jesus' crucifixion, Jesus was crowned with thorns the day before, right? He was then taken around, seated backwards on a donkey, facing the donkey's ass, okay? He was then given vinegar to drink when he asked for water as he was being taken around on the donkey. And then Jesus the next day was crucified in a field of melons and vegetables. Okay, Stephen, do you remember this from the New Testament? That Jesus was crucified in a field of melons and vegetables? Yes, dragon. We know that. They, they claim it's true. I know, but they don't care. Scholars don't care. So as you know, so now, now we filled in mysteries from the New Testament that you didn't know Jesus was actually on the donkey the day before crucifixion. The th crown of thorns was placed the day before and so on. Okay. And um, now why melons and vegetables? <clears throat> well, very interestingly, the reason that they use the idea of melons and vegetables is that um, he <laughs> was using what's called the Toledot Yeshu, which is a Jewish text, which mentions vegetables in relations to Jesus' death. And of course, he just... I don't know, he just added his own spin to that. So, since more Muslims cannot provide the original Torah and Gospel, they, they resort to attacking. That's a very good point. Later, Tafsir trying to show the Bible is corrupt. Yes, excellent. So, now in his polemics, in, Adi, in Qadi Jabbar's polemics, Christians abandoned the Mosaic Law, which is a claim that is made against us, still today. He cast blame on Paul for having introduced Roman customs, which is like the prohibition of divorce and circumcision, turning in prayer to the East, eating of pork, etc. And he also says that Paul betrayed the first Christians to the Romans. So Paul betrayed the Christians and allowed them to be killed. He was a bad man. Okay. It doesn't say anything in my Bible about Jesus facing the ass of a donkey before his crucifixion. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yes, Momo is a lie, just like Satan. Now, Kadi Jabbar, he casts doubt on the integrity of the Gospels by claiming that they are of a later origin, intended to replace the original gospel, which was taken by Jewish Christians from Jerusalem when they fled Roman persecution, right? Then, he goes on to say, he places an emphasis on the Hebrew language which ought to have been maintained by the Christians, so we were supposed to remain in the Hebrew, okay? Which is why Christians, sorry, Muslims will give us grief about, oh, but that's in Greek and Latin, it's not in the Hebrew. So, to, basically, because Islam is such an oral culture, because it's such a traditional culture they've just continued with these traditions and so echoes of these claims have remained within modern islamic polemics and he questioned the christology which gave christ a prophetical evaluation because he said no this is false now a scholar that one of the scholars that wrote the book again once i give you the links to all the books you can you can read everything for yourself so the scholar doing all the, the translation here said that all this points in the opinion of pines to the background of a judeo-christian community even more so the details on the life and teaching of Jesus. Now, because these Muslim scholars were idiots and they had no idea what they were talking about, he must have taken this from people who were familiar with Judeo-Christian traditions. However, now Jabbar misread and misunderstood or deliberately remixed apocryphal gospels as well as Gnostic texts. And he took clearly, he stole from the Toledo Yeshu, okay? of the Jews, which is a polemical account that goes against Christ, right? So he obviously misread, misunderstood, or deliberately remixed all of this nonsense. Okay, so message came in. Is, it's getting harder and harder to take Islam seriously in any way. They can claim whatever they want to their own destruction, our decision send us. Yeah, so, so understand, so these scholars clearly, so he was obviously then familiar with Gnostic and heretical Christian, well, heretical Christians, right? These are not, this is not Christianity, these are anti-Christians, right? That he was familiar with and he was clo quoting their content in his polemics. So he was not exposed to proper Christianity. Or he thought that this was, right? He rejected proper Christianity and accepted the Gnosticism, right? 
But now what's most important here, the guy who started this whole ball rolling is this guy, Saif Umar. Now, Islamic historian, quote unquote, that, that word is ooh, historian, oh my. Mickey Mouse is a better historian than this guy. So Islamic historian Saif Umar al-Tamimi, who died in about 796, reports in folios 127a to 129b of a manuscript discovered by Qasim al-Samarai in the library of the Islamic University of Imam Muhammad in Saudi, in Saudi Arabia, in Riyadh. He found in fragments of the Kitab Masir Ali wa Aisha and Kitab al Ridda wa Futu. Okay, he found certain interesting texts. Okay, so Saif ibn Umar was an early Islamic historian and compiler of reports who lived in Kufa. Interestingly, Jay Smith mentions Kufa a lot, and I've worked previously with um, um, Sneakers Corner where Kufa figures into Islamic, the development of Islam heavily. So it's coincidental that he was in Kufa, okay? So he wrote reports about, well, about Christianity. So Saif Umar discusses Paul's adverse influence on early Christianity in a discussion on the factors which led to the assassination of Caliph Uthman. So in this story, Paul is a parallel of a Jew called Abdullah bin Saba, a Jew from Sana'a in Yemen. And he was called Ibn al Sauda because he had a black mother. Now, Ibn Sabah is said to have converted to Islam in the time of Uthman, and he traveled through various countries in order to lead people astray. So he started in the Hijaz, then he went to Busra and to Kufa. Very interestingly, he then continued to preach in Al Sham, but was unable to mislead any of its inhabitants. Al Sham is Syria, if I recall. <clears throat> He was expelled to Egypt, and there he taught that Muhammad was more worthy to return than Jesus, and he laid down the doctrine of the return. He then taught that there were 1,000 prophets, and that every prophet had a regent. So Ali was the regent of Muhammad, and his next teaching was the doctrine that Muhammad was the seal of the prophets, while Ali was the seal of the regents. Okay, so why need Ida wars after Muhammad exactly? So yeah. So, Ibn Saba then developed the doctrines which became the basis of the, the split, the schism between the Shiite and Sunni sects, right? And he says, this is exactly as what happened with Paul when Paul laid down the basis for the discord between the different Christian sects. And of course, here we go, this is Muhammad, this is what the seal of the prophets looks like. That's a seal, you know, it's got the beard, seal of the prophets, moving on. So, Saif Umar and Paul's trick. So, let's learn about Paul from Saif Umar, okay, this, histori this historian of Christianity. After Jesus went to heaven, right, so after the assumption of Jesus, right, after the ascension, Jesus had 700 families as followers. Paul, who was the king of the Jews, whose name was Abu Shaul, urged that the Christians be killed, but they succeeded in escaping. Paul warned the Jews that the followers of Jesus would basically befriend the Jews' enemies and then come back to wage battle against the Jews. So they accepted Paul's suggestion. Now previously the rabbis convinced Paul, but here Paul suggests, okay, now it's a different story. Paul suggests a trick to prevent this disaster. Paul leaves his royal position as king of the Jews, puts on the clothes of the followers of Jesus, takes off his royal robes, and he goes to the army of the Christians to deceive them. The religion of making it up as you go along, precisely. So, now the Christians, now there's a gap in the story, so the, the, the historian, the translator, what I've read from the books here, he goes on to this section. The Christians praised the Lord for the miracle of Paul's capture. Okay, so Paul is captured. At his request, they bring him to the chiefs of the Christians, and he tells them that he had met Jesus, who had taken his hearing, sight, and reason. When Jesus returned his faculties, he promised the Lord to serve the cause of his followers and to teach them the Torah and its rules. The Christians believed him. So on the, his orders, they built a house for him where he devoted himself to a religious life. And after he had locked himself into the house, so he locks himself into the house, he tells them that he had had a vision in which he was instructed that the only correct direction, dragon, yes, Paul was not a king. I know, I know. Let's ask these guys to prove this. But hey, the, the facts don't matter here. So he instructs them that the only direct, correct direction for prayer was towards the east. So the Christians believed him and they left their Qibla. Did you know you had a Qibla? Does your church have a Qibla? It doesn't? Oh my God, you're doing Christianity wrong, buddy. You need to listen to Saif Umar. So, <laughs> so anyway, Paul then convinced them with another vision that all food was permissible in the eyes of Allah. Okay. So, okay, fine. 
Debbie David, thank you very much. So great to see you, Bruce. Prayers for Sister Hartin, yes. Um, yeah, well, look, I mean, I have a little bit more training than Hartin has, so, yeah. you know, so yeah, I, I understand the risks, but um, yeah, so does she, so, so guys, but, so anyway, he then convinces them that all foods are permissible, and then after a third vision, Paul convinces Christians it is their duty to abolish any form of violence and revenge. So they accept this, and the Christians then abolish jihad. Did you know that we used to do jihad? We used to do warfare. We did jihad, but because of Paul, we abolished this. Now, of course, you'll notice that an echo of this is reflected in Islamic polemics today and the apologetics, where they say, but you're supposed to be peaceful. You're supposed to turn the other cheek. This is an echo of these statements from Saif Umar. Now, finally, Paul has a vision that he wants to reveal only to a small group. So he sends away everyone except Jacob, Nestor, and Malcolm. Jacob, Nestor, and Malcolm, who founded the sects of the Jacobites, the Nestorians, and the Malkites. And he has a fourth person, the believer, right? So he tries to convince them that Allah has in fact made himself, God has made himself manifest to them in the person of Jesus, but had then withdrawn from their sight. So this statement causes discussions and argument and various Trinitarian doctrines then arose during this discussion. So, yeah. So the believer, he then stresses to these three, right, plus Paul, that all of this is contradictory to the true teachings of Jesus because the believer knows the true teachings. Consequently, the believer leaves them and he urges his followers to remain faithful to the only true teaching, which is that of Jesus. Okay? Now, each of the four that is taken into Paul's confidence gathered a group of followers and the believer had the smallest group. Paul urges the other three to fight the believer, to go and kill them, right? However, they flee to Palestine. I wonder who they are. And there they are taken captive by the Jews, the poor, poor victims, these poor victims, these poor victims. Paul fights them and they flee and then they're taken captive. Poor guys. So these writings don't match with history and evidence though, which is, which, yes, it's laughable. But understand, this is legitimately the history written by major scholars of Islam. It's like I'm telling you, Einstein wrote this. Okay? They're Einstein. They're Newton. They wrote this nonsense. Okay? So, they then ask the Jews to leave them alone since they are, they just want to live in caves, they want to live in hermitages and on mountain tops, and they want to wander through the countryside. So, unfortunately, over time, their offspring introduce heresies into their religion, except for a small remnant, a few of them, who are followers of the believer, who survive among them, and they stay loyal to the original doctrine. Some of them escape to the Arabian Peninsula, eventually, where 30 of them lived as monks, and eventually, they saw the Prophet Muhammad, and they believed in him, and they died as Muslims. Okay, so they believed in him and they die as Muslims. So the role of Paul in the corruption of Christianity, according to this story, has two roots, right? One, Paul corrupted important rules of the religious law, right? And two, he spoiled the kernel of the faith itself. Now let's learn about Al-Damari and Paul's sacrificial suicide because Paul was suicidal and killed himself. I bet you didn't know that. And the Christians say Christ is the son of Allah. That is what they say with their mouths. That's in Quran 9.3. So in the book called the Hayat al-Hayawan by al-Damari, which is quoted on the authority of al-Qalbi, in the story, the Christians follow Islam for 81 years after the assumption, the ascension of Jesus. Then a war breaks out between the Christians and the Jews. As a subterfuge, Paul, who had killed many followers of Jesus, right, presents himself to the Christians as a repentant co-religionist. Okay? So, he then tricks the Christians, right? So, after having studied the gospel in their church for a whole year, okay, Paul goes to Jerusalem. He then teaches Nestor that Jesus, Mary, and God are the three members of the Trinity. So, it's, it's not a last fault that people think that Mary is one of the Trinity because the Quran says so. No, 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 no. This is Paul's fault. And then he leaves Nestor as his lieutenant. Stephen Gilchrist says, no, I didn't, Lloyd. I would never have thought that Paul was suicidal. Well, he is, okay? We're going to find out. So, so anyway, let's go on. Paul then goes to the land of the Romans. Which land? I don't know. He just goes to the land of the Romans, where he taught a man called Jacob that Jesus was not a man, but Jesus became a man, and that Jesus had no body, but he became a body, and that Jesus was the Son of God. Then he converts a man called Malcolm, the Malkites, who he teaches that Jesus was and is God. And then Paul kills himself as a sacrifice to Jesus. 
And each of the three disciples begin to call upon their followers, right, their fellow men, to adopt their doctrine. And this was the origin of the three Christian sects. This is how Christianity split, because Paul taught three separate doctrines to three separate men. Okay? So now, a version of the story is quoted by Al-Qarafi. Right? And there's a, I have a note there about Al-Qarafi, so let's have a look at who this guy is. So, he writes in his polemical work, al Adriba al-Fakira, which is a polemical work written by the 13th century Egyptian Maliki scholar, Shihab al-Din al-Qarafi. Right? And in English it means, splendid replies to insolent questions. Splendid replies to insolent questions. This was a response to Christians who were saying, like, what the heck is going on here? So he's considered by many to be the greatest Maliki legal theoretician of the 13th century. This is the one of the finest scholars of Islam of that century. This work was the first of three major Muslim refutations provoked by an apology for Christianity written around the year 1200 by the Malkite Bishop of Sidon, Paul of Antioch. So that's the history of this book. So Paul, before he commits suicide in an act he claimed was a sacrifice to Christ, reveals the contradictory doctrines concerning Jesus to the three Christian kings who used to come on pilgrimage to him every year while he lived in a hermitage with a monk who he had been able to convince of his sincerity and kindness. So did you know that three Christian kings used to come visit Paul every year in his little cottage? Emile Bonsil says, Islam and its sources are very stupid. <laughs> Dude, this is beyond stupid. This is like three stages beyond stupid. Yes, the three kings. The three kings came to visit Paul in his little cottage every year. And he reveals his deceit to them, and then he kills himself as a sacrifice to Jesus. After his death, the king and their followers, all the kings, started to fight each other, which is what Paul had wanted them to do. Paul acted in this way, according to the documents by al Qarafi and so on, because he was a Jew. And he used to fight and kill many Christians. JDR, Paul's suicide, he was beheaded. Look, look, please don't confuse these Muslims with the facts, okay? Don't. They don't like the facts. So, <laughs> anyway, now understand there are common elements and there's a certain intent behind all of these stories. Okay, and this is not even all the stories. So, there are elements that are there are elements common to by the way this is still i'm still developing this it's still under research i'm still busy writing okay this is not a finished thing so there will be errors in this thing okay for real you warned me that this would mess up <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is stuff is nuts anyway so there are elements that are common to four versions there are at least four versions there are four main versions of the story shall we say that are discussed in the original document and this is the idea that the contradictory and perverted beliefs concerning jesus are ultimately the cause but caused by the jews Okay, so in some versions of the corruption of Christian belief, Paul is present, but in other versions from other scholars, Paul is not present. Okay, yeah, the three kings only visited Jesus once, but Paul, yeah. Paul uses his conversion as a trick to lead Christians astray. This is a means to smear both groups. They smear the Jews as duplic duplicitous, right, dishonest, and the Christians as dupes, as idiots, right? So, of course, now, let's learn about St. Paul and Paul of Samosota. So, in some of these documents, you hear certain stories that are out of time, right? They're, they're set in the wrong time. But also, they make claims that cannot be about Paul, but do fit with Paul of Samosota. So, Islamic scholars, my view is this is deliberate. This is not an accident. So, they conflate St. Paul with Paul of Samosota, who's known as Bulus. I'm just going to move my camera over to the, to the top left for a second. Uh, Okay, so Paul of Samosota, who's known as Bulus al-Shamshati, he was the patriarch of Antioch in 260 AD. Now, he was dismissed for a heresy in 269, okay? Like 70 bishops got together and said, look, we've got to kick this guy out of the church because this man has gone wrong, okay? So he is dismissed in 269 for the Paulianist heresy, which is a form of, mono which is a form of monarchianism, Right, monarchianism, which is Unitarianism, it's an anti-Trinitarian doctrine, and adoptionism, where God adopted Jesus because Jesus was so perfect, was so good that God said, "You know what? I'm gonna, I'm gonna ad adopt you and make you a god." So this is where man becomes god. Okay, so according to the 19th century canon of the First Council of Nicaea, Paul of Samosota's followers could remain in the church only if they rebaptized themselves. Okay, so what percentage of Mohammedan Muslims are versed in this fiction? Uh, DHC, look. I'd say roughly 100%. Now, not word for word, not verbatim. They don't know the details. They don't know the facts. It took me some digging to look up this stuff, to find this stuff. It's not that easy. But understand that all Muslims, in some shape, way, or form, have the gist of this stuff. You know, th think about the polemics on YouTube. 
you know, on Facebook, the, the comments they make, the, the, this, this idea, these ideas are there, if not the specifics, right? So, <clears throat> in some Islamic polemical sources, Bulus al, al Shumshati, right, was the first to claim that Jesus combined manhood and divinity. So, he invented this fiction that Jesus was God and man, right? So, he was the first. So, some polemicists said, no, Bulus did this, right? Who's Paul of Samosota. And they also claim that prior to this, Christians were all unanimous in their belief that Jesus was just a human, right? So these polemicists then claim that Christians were unanimous. And obviously this is a complete fabrication. This is clearly a lie. But also this is a Gnostic belief, right? This is a, a, her a heresy like Arianism and others. So they were pushing Gnostic Christianity. They've been exposed, not, sorry, I wouldn't want to say, no, Gnostic anti-Christian heresy, right? Because Gnostics are not Christians, right? Heretics are not Christians, they're anti-Christian. So. He, they were exposed to these things. So they mix up the two poles. Exactly. That's exactly what they did. Right? So what happens is, now, this is precisely, if we go here, sorry. So this is precisely the role attributed to Paul in Saif's work, where Paul is accused of being the first to have spoiled the religion of the Christians. But other scholars make exactly the same claim, that, that Paul of Samosota is the first to have spoiled the religion of the Christians. So some write this, all of these claims about Paul, they write about Paul of Samosota. And then others write this about St. Paul. Now, I have seen one supposed refutation of the idea that Paul, Bullus, was the mighty messenger. So there were two messengers who were sent to Antioch and they were not weak, they were too weak. And Paul was the mighty messenger sent to strengthen them, which obviously occurs in the Quran and is discussed in various of the Tafsir. I will be coming to that in the future, right? So many, many Islamic scholars claim that Paul, St. Paul, the, the one we know as St. Paul, is the one who is the mighty messenger sent. Okay, Bulus was sent to strengthen the other two scholars, right? So many, many scholars. Now, one scholar, Scholier, sorry, let me rephrase that. One of these idiots on the internet, one of these Islamic polemicists, complete idiot on the internet, writes that there is a time difference between Paul, St. Paul, and the claims that are being made within, within the Tafsis about, you know, Paul. Right, being in Antioch at that time, he says, look, at that time, this had happened and that had happened. But if you line up the time gap, he says it's like a 200-year gap. It could not have been St. Paul. So if you look at the fact that there's a 200-plus-year time gap, this obviously is in reference to St. Paul of Samosota. So this would explain that discrepancy. So, yeah. <clears throat> okay, so moving on. Now, um, Emil says, Paul's name is also Saul. It's not Paul who became Paul. He was citizen of two cities as per those days, only one Paul, correct? So... St. Paul, then let's look at Shahrastani, okay, in his book, The Milal Wa Nihal, right? So they are so hopeless. How do they think this? Such, yeah, brainwashing. Now, Shahrastani, in his Kitab Al Milal Wa Nihal, seems based, so he's, he takes the main tradition, okay? So he accuses Paul of having made himself a partner of Simon Peter. So Paul comes along and says, hey, Peter, I'm going to join you, okay? And then he changes the basis of knowledge and he mixed Paul, Peter's knowledge with the knowledge of the philosophers and Paul's own confused ideas. So he corrupts the Gospels, he corrupts Christianity by associating with Peter and then mixing up Peter's story. Okay, Shachristani accuses Paul of a corruption of the scriptures and he provides an example of this by mentioning points from the, from the passage on Melchizedek in the epistle to the Hebrews. Okay, so he references Hebrews 6.20-7.17. to Claims which he calls the epistle of Paul to the Greeks and he claims to have seen a copy of this. Okay, fine and well. But now let's have a look at what um, this guy, Shahrastani, has written about Islam. This is from the Milal one here, Nihal, which is about Muhammad. And he, this is where, obviously, why they want to take down Christianity and elevate Muhammad for this reason. He writes in the Milal one Nihal, long before the creation of the world, Allah took a ray of light from the splendor of his own glory and united it to the body of Muhammad. So Muhammad was made long before the creation of the earth and before the creation of the universe, Muhammad is made of the same essence as Allah. Okay? And he says, Allah says, Muhammad, thou art the elect, the chosen. I will make the members of thy family the guides to salvation, which is the promise made to Abraham in the Bible, of course. Muhammad said, the first thing which Allah created was my light and my spirit. Muhammad is the very first soul made. But understand, he's not made. He is of the essence of Allah. Right? In due time, the world was created. So Muhammad was made before the creation of the earth. And don't forget, within these, when you read through these sira, when you read through the rest of this book, the Milal, Milal Wa Nihal and similar, the universe is made for Muhammad. For Muhammad. Okay? 
So the first thing, okay, is my light and my spirit, which God created. In the due time, the world was created, but not until the birth of Muhammad did this ray of glory appear. It is well known to all Muslims as the nur i Muhammadi, the light of Muhammad. Okay, so understand, this is what uh, Shah Rastani wrote. Now, if he's willing to write this kind of complete bogus trash about Mo, what do you think he's going to write about Christianity when he dislikes it severely? Okay, so, yeah. So now, let's look at bad Christian. So Paul was a bad Jew, but actually, no, 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 that's wrong. He was a bad Christian. Okay, don't listen to those bad Muslim historians and scholars. Listen to these stupid Muslim historians and scholars. So the other Islamic tradition paints Paul as a cunning and roguish Jew out for mischief and assisting mischief doers, a troublemaker and power seeker who employed all kinds of tricks to this end. But in this version, Paul's conversion is genuine. So because he conflicts with the Jews after conversion, he goes to the Romans for protection. He goes to the governor with the claim that he followed the religion of Caesar, king of the Romans, and he had broken away from the Jewish religion. And by doing so, Paul obviously betrays the true religion of Jesus, which is Islam. Okay, fine. So he does this not out of loyalty to the Jews, because he's not doing it as a trick now to get to the Christians. He needs safety from the Romans, but he also wants to get influence by the Romans to incite them against the Jews out of revenge, because the Jews try to kill him. So Paul's corruption of Christianity is then by introducing pagan Roman customs into Christianity, and this is a pro-Roman, anti-Jewish strategy. Right? So now, Paul abolishes circumcision, he violates the rules of ritual purity and food prohibitions, as well as he changes the direction of prayer. Uh, Emil says, I believe when we will be with Christ, we can watch Muhammad, especially in hell, suffering. Ah, uh, man. Now, Qadi al-Jabbar, okay, the major, one of the major scholars from the 11th century, in his version, as discussed by a scholar called Pines and Stern, now, Pines wrote some of the early stuff that I read for you before, but Stern basically came along and corrected some of it. There were some errors that he found, right? So he presents a detailed elaboration of this tradition. So Qadi al-Jabbar speaks about this, okay? However, in Jabbar's version, it doesn't contain any references to Paul's, Paul's influence on the emergence of the Trinitarian heresies. So each of these scholars has their own version of these stories. They're all over the place. None of them match up. None of them line up. Now, Saif's version of Paul in short summary, and then I'm going to, let me see how far I am. So because I will start winding down this, uh, I actually have no idea how far I am. Okay. So Saif's story is a confusion of elements from both traditions, right? Where Paul's a Christian and where Paul's a Jew. So there was the legend focused on the contradictory views of Islam and Christianity regarding the status of Jesus. So Islam believed something about Jesus and Christianity said something else. So there was a contradiction. Now, Paul, obviously, in the main tradition, becomes a Jew who fakes conversion to combat Christianity. Now, this version is the basis for this, this Saif um, from his narrative, right? This 8th century guy, Saif. Now, a few elements of the other tradition where Paul now becomes a Christian, okay, such um, as Paul's change of the Kibla and his abolition of the food prohibitions were then added in afterwards, it would seem, right? Paul's abolition of the Jihad is very specific to Saif's version of the story, okay? And Paul's conflict with the Jews and his connections with the Romans are completely left out in Saif's report. So these versions, so there are certain versions with certain factors, but certain parts of these stories, but some are not. So understand, it's just to say that it's completely, this is completely a mess. It's all over the place. The scholars can't get their stories straight, okay? So now, Finally, let's talk about Saif and the believer. So the believer is integral to the story, even in versions in which Paul is not mentioned. So there are multiple versions of the story, at least four, right? The believer doesn't figure in Ibn al-Jabbar's version, okay? But the believer and his followers represent Islam and the belief in the continuity and the uniformity of the theological preaching of all the prophets, including Moses, Jesus, and Muhammad, which is a fundamental doctrine in, in the Quran, basically saying that all the way from Abraham, from Adam, in fact, all the way to Abraham, all the way through Jesus, David, Moses, and so on, all the way to Muhammad, they were all preaching the same message. But of course, Muslims then read the Bible, the New Testament, and realized, oopsie, right? So now, so this is part of the fundamental doctrine of Islam, but the believer then says, look, you know what? Christianity was different to what, you know, came after Paul, and, you know, we, we representing the true teachings of Jesus, and of course, this then they meet Muhammad, and they find that, yes, they were following the right path. Now, this idea of a secret believer is actually a parallel to a story in Quran 40, verse 28, where a secret believer defends Moses. Would you kill a man because he saith, my Lord is Allah, and hath brought you clear proofs from your Lord? So they've taken this idea, okay, of someone defending Moses, 
And here they've got someone who's defending Jesus. That is their story. This is how they pitch this thing. So guys, I'm going to end here. Okay, this is the end of part one. Islam being the religion of deceit. Am I driving too fast, Lloyd? Sorry, what do you mean? <laughs> Sorry, I'm hiccups. Uh, it's, yeah, I was away for a week. I just got back. It's, uh, it's, it's about a billion degrees here in Warsaw. It's crazy hot. Uh, Irene Morpa says, there are no excuses in eternity and Muslims are hearing the truth and we stand against them. So guys, yeah, so this presentation, look, this is new research I've been working on and um, it's a little raw still. I'm busy cleaning this up. So there is a presentation on part two. Okay, so leading up to the Gospel of Barnabas, I'll be talking about. Part three will present the neutral to positive evidence of Muslim scholars and historians regarding St. Paul. And guys, again, please like, share, subscribe. Um, I always forget this. All the reference books I will add again in the description box for download. And um, But you can find all of these, Google the names, you'll be able to find them. And please donate if you feel this is useful and if you want to support me. But these documents, I'm going to go back to some of these documents so you can see them again. This is a very long document. Okay, this one is 230 pages. Okay, so here I'm going to go to page, I think, 153 to the relevant section. Okay, so this is... So let me go... This is the... Okay, yeah, so this is the relevant section here. Uh, one for, here we go. Chapter 8 in this document is what's relevant. Early Islamic perspectives on the Apostle Paul as a narrative framework for Takhrif. So I will be talking about Takhrif itself, right? But by Michael Kuhn. So, so this is the section that's, that has the real meat in it, okay? Then there's this document, right? Look it up later. The Bible through a Quranic filter, scripture falsification. I'll be using this for the third part, okay? This I've used heavily for this section. This, this, this document is gold. It's hysterical reading to learn how stupid these scholars are. Um, so guys, um, thank you, JR. Um, yeah, please guys share it. Let people know. <clears throat> yeah, guys. So, so now, you know, and I've, I've summarized hundreds of pages. <laughs> okay. Seriously. I've had to summarize and I, I went through a lot of stuff that didn't have the right info. And eventually I found these documents. So, oh yes, Debbie, sorry about that. I shall uh, be in touch. Um, yeah. So guys, this is what Muslim scholars have been writing from the 8th to the 14th century about Apostle Paul. This is the origin of the Islamic polemics. This is the level of ignorance, of utter stupidity and deceit that Muslim scholars indulged in. Okay. And uh, yeah, any questions, guys? No, thank you very much, DHC. I'm glad you guys enjoyed it. Um, yeah, so any questions uh, that I can take before I call, a, call an end? So, so yeah, look, oh, by the way, some of these documents are dense, okay? They're academic documents. They're written by university professors. These are dense, okay? They're not easy reading. So I had to summarize a lot of stuff here. Uh, yes, Plain Cult, Inspired by Satan. And Lexo, thank you very much. Thank you. And they believe it took, yeah, they believe it all. Hook, line, and sinker. They have to. It's required in the fiqh. Um, so, yeah, guys, um, I will be back with uh, with part two soon. I'm busy working on part three and part four and so on on this, uh, which are different angles on this. And there's a lot of things I need to do. So that's why I'm quiet because I'm mad. I'm reading, I'm researching, I'm busy making slides, trying to summarize so much. So guys, thank you. Um, if there's no more questions, I'll call it a night here. Okay. And um, yeah, I hope that was very, very useful to you all. Uh, please tell people about this. Please bring this up. Um, I will make a note of the original documents in a moment. And so please tell people, let people know. Muslims have to own up to the fact that their scholars are the most deceitful people to ever live. There's no way they can defend these stories. There's no way they can prove any of this. This is clearly fictional, deliberate fictional. I don't think this is an accident. Okay. And um, yeah. So Maimuna 50, thank you. Very informative. Yes, I am, am grateful. Thank you. Um, so guys, yes. Anything, anything you need, drop, you know, drop a comment in the uh, below after the video. Um, DHC says, have a good evening, Lord. God bless everyone. Keep out in your prayers. Good health and protection. Yes, guys. Um, Islam is the religion of peace, so you don't have to worry. No one's going to stab you in public in a park. Okay. Um, jihad just means to, to, to wage war on the salads, you know, to, to be a better person. Okay. And um, nobody believes that. And I think they've kind of, um, at some point, they're going to push too far. 
right? In fact, they've really gone too far. I don't know why, but they're protected. Of course, they're protected species, you know. So, but guys, anyway, let's call it a night. Thank you. I hope this was useful. Now you can see how ridiculous Islam is. You can see the basis for all of the very, very fictitious beliefs and stories that their current polemics are built upon. So, yeah, this is the basis of Islam. This is scholarship in Islam. Cheers, guys. Uh, Paul, a lawyer, corrupt Christianity in moment, the human agent of darkness, lead the nations. Yeah, whatever. They'll just make up whatever they like. Take care, guys. See you. Good night. Bye.